Welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible and that together we can make it happen. I'm Amanda Scott and I spent the first series of this podcast laying out the basic toolkit that we think is essential to making conscious evolution a possibility, which is the entire premise behind the whole Accidental Gods project. This podcast, the website, and the membership portal that lies behind it. Since then, we've been exploring that extraordinary, living, inspiring intersection where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, from which we can craft a vision of a future that is generative for all of us, for the human and the more than human worlds. My guest this week is someone who fully inhabits that intersection between the human and the more than human, that grounded place where the earth meets the sky, where the fire is the spark of life. Fiona Shaw is a healer and a holder of ceremony who works in an ancient lineage of which she is an acknowledged medicine woman. She holds ceremonies of extraordinary integrity and groundedness and sheer raw power here in the UK helping people to connect to the things that are real, to our heritage, and also to all that we can become if we really try, if we let go, if we ask for the help of the land. So people of the podcast, please welcome Fiona Shaw. Fiona Shaw, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast on this absolutely beautiful day of the equinox. It's such a pleasure to invite you here. Thank you so much. Lovely to be having this opportunity to speak with you again, Manda. Thank you. So it is the day of the equinox today. We were up the hill this morning. I am guessing you were probably doing things at your end. But as I understand it, you've just come from a full weekend ceremony honouring the equinox. And it seems to me, because it is the equinox and because what we're trying to do is really find ways to help people to connect to the land and to open to the land. Perhaps could you talk a little bit about the ceremony and then we can talk about how you came to be a person who is holding that nature and that depth and that intensity of ceremony. Yes, so I carry a lineage, the fire of Itsachi Latlan, and when I was given this bundle, given this initiation to be a medicine woman within that lineage the invitation was to use the form the design of the ceremony to remember the medicine of our own land Mm. with the understanding that that sacred fire belonged to everybody right that in with the understanding also that that Fire is like the origin before religion, before other ideas came in. The people, us, sat with the fire, sat with the water, Mm -hmm. sat on the earth and connected to what was holding us. Yes. And my understanding is that on this land, we prayed particularly at the equinoxes and the solstice and Samhain and Imbolc and those moments because we were so connected to the land, we were in gratitude and we also prayed. And the gratitude is thank you for this harvest and please help our seed grow in the next cycle. And so in my journey to remember the medicine of our land, I'm carrying this altar and this form, but we always try, or I always try to hold ceremonies very close to these moments Mm. in order for us to remember who we are way beyond the current paradigm. Right. And so, yes, we just met this weekend. Um, We sat around the fire in a circle. There were 30 of us to comply with the fact that we're allowed to meet as a religious ceremony in groups of 30s. We are a religious ceremony. Right. And 
it's very profound because it, it, it becomes the reminder. We always work with an intention, a group intention, a collective intention. And actually finding the intention is half the work. So a few of us spent time thinking, what do we, what do the people need at this particular moment in time? What's happening around us collectively and what will serve us to go into the winter months? Yeah. The purpose of this ceremony, the intention of this ceremony was to remember our connection with our allies in order to be whole, integrated and with integrity with the understanding that all that's going on politically, energetically, is pulling us from that center place, the place of our integrity, yes. the fear. And so rather than going into all of the fear and all that's not right, we're wanting to remember what serves us. And I think we were talking a while ago about um, how to work in these times. And I said something, it's about going back to our practices again and again. And mm. so we use this space to elevate our vibration and remember the truth of our vibration. Right. But also... Perhaps what I love most about these ceremonies is the is a safety which I understand is connected to the format of the ceremony, which is very, very ancient and has been repeated again and again and again, which creates a power in itself by being obedient to it. Right. That gives us this level of safety. And I also feel that's enhanced because of the spirits that travel with me. And those guides and allies that travel with me are my personal ones, but also the spirits and guides that accompany this lineage. Right. And so it feels like there's a bit of a gravitas there uh, just by their presence. Yes. And so what happens in the ceremonies, also because it is the direction of my work, is there's a very deep level of emotional releasing. Right. Which somehow that safety of reaching the deep grief, the rage, the shock, and giving it to the fire, moving it towards the fire, and being witnessed at the same time by a small community that brings us the memory of being in tribe in, or in village that so many people carry the grief of the loss of. Yes. That witnessing it means that something can be let go of and then the elevation can happen. So the, the spirits that are there can lift us up. But the, so the journey is messy in the, in the, in the sense of the deepest healing is often looks messy from the outside. Mm. And always when the light comes back in the morning, everybody, pretty much everybody is in a different space, although it takes a lot of time to integrate. And what I noticed this time, Manda, which is related to this time, I suppose, was there was so much sorrow. Yeah. Deep, deep sadness and rage. There was two elements to it, was my sense. Is one is the desecration that's happening on the earth. Mm. And this tradition is an earth-honoring tradition. We... We, it's not very, I haven't found a way to transfer it to Zoom. It really is about sitting directly on yeah. the land and feeling the spirits of that piece of land. Um, so we're earth lovers. And so there's a, a, there's a deep grief that almost cannot be expressed. It's so huge. And uh, then there's also that personal grief that seems to be around in so many stories at the invitation of the movement of this time. So there was an enormous amount of sorrow yes. um, and rage. And can you say a little bit more about the rage? Is that that's a collective rage also at the desecration of the earth and also a personal rage at the politics of the time? That's a question. I, th I think there is a, a a rage about the politics of the time, yes. But I feel, and, you know, it's just a sense, uh, I'm the kind of conductor of the ceremony, so I, it's what I feel in my body. It's very connected to the feeling of disempowerment and helplessness mm -hmm. about how to make a change and wanting it so much for all beings 
particularly the next seven generations. And and we we've been making these prayers. Well, I've been walking this particular path for 25 years now. And when we were praying for the protection of the water, that it would always be clean 25 years ago, it was a little bit of a dream. It was a prayer that kind of was said, but we didn't really, I I don't remember sensing the level of urgency. Yes. And now it's very, very different. It is a reality that our water could be unclean for our grandchildren. Yes. And, and that sense of um, helplessness. And I think what can come through on the positive side is that while we're releasing all these feelings is also the memory that we are absolutely not alone. We're accompanied by our ancestors, our guides and allies, and there is so much support. Yes. And so once you've moved this feeling of disempowerment, grief, rage, despair, whatever's there, there's so much love available and so much possibility. And so I'm really with these, this, these two things that as we elevate ourselves, we do not have an idea how it will look, but it for sure, elevating ourselves supports that change. Yes. And that's why ceremonial work is so important. We don't really have a clue how many spirits are being impacted by our prayers and our work, but I feel unquestionably that a lot happens. Yes. So let's talk about the spirits that are impacted by our prayers and our work. And if we go back a little bit, you said that in finding the intent, you are looking for what do the people need. And my understanding is that this is the 30 people who are with you through the night. Is it is it in a yurt, a roundhouse? It's usually in a teepee um, or a malocca or a roundhouse, okay. yes. Um, selecting the intention is uh, for the collective, actually. So my question then is, is it the collective of these lands, the United Kingdom or Britain, or is it it presumably by now it's the planetary global. collective. Yes, it's totally global. What we want is we want to see the um, evolution of our consciousness. Yeah. So we're looking always. Okay, what's happening to me personally? What's happening in the collective? And what needs to change in me that supports me? Uh, and that what would support the collective? And we're always coming from our relate. You know, it's a relationship with the spirits, the invisible ones. Yes. So the reminder of this purpose. I wanted people to go away rem with a tool, actually, to journey into these winter months. The tool that felt very relevant is to remember our allies and, where, and our connection yes. with the fire, with the elements, with our guides, with our ancestors, with beings from very high dimensions, with the light beings, and not to get caught into the game that's happening between yes. the light and the dark beings. And so that's like, like any of our practices, meditating every day to keep elevated, but not bypassing yes. the emotions that are coming up because they're really valuable as well. Yes. And I get a lot of interesting feedback from people who say, who, who are caught in an internal contextual paradox where they don't know how to keep elevated without bypassing. So can we talk mm -hmm. a little bit about your experience of of doing exactly that in real time, in ceremony and in the rest of your life? Mm. Um, I think my work has been um, emotional authenticity. Yeah. I'm a midwife and um, I kind of have a deep trust if you make a safe space enough uh, safe enough, then we can drop deeper and hear our true voice. Right. And understanding that our true voice is overlaid with layers of defenses and patterns for all the different reasons, whether it's lifetimes of stuff or child stuff or whatever. And so dismantling those is a very challenging process but it is my work. So it's about finding the safety to feel the deep feelings. And my true belief is that unless it's witnessed, it just can't move. It has to be witnessed. We are social beings. We aren't isolated beings. So we need someone else to witness that in order to be able to let it go. Okay. And that is incredibly powerful in these ceremonies where people 
really go to some very, very, very deep places and are weeping or whatever mm. while everyone's singing and the ceremony carries on. But to have had that held is transformational. It's like allows the person to allow those feelings yes. in themselves because other people have allowed it in its purity, not fixed it, not stroked them, not tried to make them better, but just allowed them to, to run it until it's finished and we carry on and we're with you. And that's really a contradiction, isn't it, to how our, our yes. society runs. Yes. So it's very freeing. It's very profound. Um, I can't remember your question now. Amanda. That's, no, but you're answering it. It was how, to, <laughs> okay. how really to reach that level of elevation that we need to in order not to get caught up in the difficulties of whatever is dragging us in other directions, but without spiritual bypassing. But the question that arises from the fact that it's so much better when it's done in company is we're in the middle of lockdown. Only 30 people mm -hmm. were able to come to your ceremony. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that people listening can begin to find that level of authenticity in a lockdown situation, because as you said, Zoom is Zoom is hard for doing ceremony that requires that you be on the earth. Although my own experience is if I go up and sit on the earth alone, that my that I feel a connection with the spirits of the land and the spirits that we're discussing. I don't feel alone alone. And yet coming together in tribe in ceremony is such an extraordinary, powerful thing. Mm. Is there a way that we can help a larger collective to find enough authenticity and connection to the elements, to the spirits, without leading them all through ceremony? Particularly in the current moment where it looks like we're heading back into a version of lockdown. Very good question. Um, I guess for me, the safest place to go is to nature. So to go and lean against a tree or to sit by the water and to literally invoke the support of the elemental being of the water or the spirit of the tree, you know, to really ask it and then pay attention to what emotions need meeting and to know that when you're doing it in that little ceremonial moment, if suddenly you feel fear, not to think, oh dear, I'm not spiritual because I'm feeling my fear, but to get curious. Yes. Where has this come from? Is this mine? What is the deep, what's it trying to say to me? You know, really curious, engage with it, really engage with it. And if you're sitting by the water, when, when you found the depth of it, speaking with the water, help me, see me, help me be more fluid in this place. You know, like, I, I feel like most of our, all of our work is with the elements. I'm, I, I work with the elements, particularly the fire. Yes. And so by sitting in the fire, asking my questions in ceremony when I'm holding everybody, I'm watching the fire to reply to me. And when we put the fire when we set up the fire, we are invoking the spirits, the ancestors, the allies, the guides, the li my lineage. And my feeling is what happens is that I, when I'm holding the space, I become empty and I'm watching the fire. And so what comes through me is I, f I think it's what the spirits are inviting me to say. Yeah. But it is really with the fire. It's like the fire is, when it moves, when it drops, when it changes shape, it brings the messages into my head as a way to explain it. And so, you know, if in this time, use the fire. And when you sense this feeling of being trapped in old stories, old beliefs, sit in front of a fire and call in your spiritual allies. Make a sacred space. And even if it's 10 minutes, offer this story and cut ties to it yes cut ties to the beliefs of these stories and the patterns and actually you know for all the difficulty of these times my experience is that there's an enormous amount of support which is why so much is coming up for so many people it's ready to be transformed it's it's moving very 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 fast and the transformations i'm seeing in people around me are very fast 
Yes. So it's a, it's an incredible, I don't know if you're finding it the same, but it yeah. seems to be an incredible time to be able to move your consciousness. Yes, yes. It's as if everything is accelerating. You're right. Everything is moving faster. Things that would have taken years Absolutely. are happening in you know, in moments almost. I'm possibly exaggerating a bit, but I'm certainly watching. It's as if all of the curves have tipped upwards. Yeah. And the willingness. It's suddenly like people are willing or they they know they need it and this is their moment. And yeah. And they haven't felt that urgency before. So I find that very exciting yeah. and it gives me a lot of hope. Yes. And 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 therefore we hope to give everybody else hope as well. Because it seems to me that hope and agency are absolutely key. And and hope is not that everything will suddenly become baskets of kittens no. and bunches of roses, but it's hope that difference is possible, that we can, as you said, evolve to be something different, but that it takes work from all of us mm -hmm. to to keep doing exactly what you've said. And I, I think this idea that we can sit with water, we can sit with fire, even if it's a candle, if we're on the 10th floor of a tower mm -hmm. block in you know, the middle of London and we're not allowed out, we can still light a candle and mm. connect. We are those elements. I think it's understanding, you know, we're mainly made up of water and we have the fire of light, fire of the original light inside us. We are those elements. Yes. So and the flesh and the bones and the teeth of the earth and the breath of the air and we can bring them all together. Yeah. So it's not as unfamiliar as it might seem. So when you... You know, you sit with that that candle. The ancient part of you will remember something. Yes, the ancient part of us does remember. I was listening to a podcast with a forest school teacher the other day, and she was talking about having brought a group of inner city school children and taught them how to light their own fires with you know a, an iron, mm. a flint and iron. And this little lad who had the reputation of being unruly and difficult and bouncing off the walls, and you know the kind of person that they would give ritalin into. God help us all. And he lit his fire and he sat with it unmoving for 90 minutes. And eventually she went oh. and just sat beside him and said, are, oh. are you okay? He said, I've never oh. seen a fire before. Oh, oh that brings tears to my eyes. Just, it's just so heartrending. And oh. yet he has now. And the magic of that and the ancient, ancient, deep in our bones. I was really interested that for you, the questions are, Thank you for this harvest. Please let the seed grow in the next cycle, which is we are an agrarian community now, a culture, species. But I am sure that the sitting with the fire happened when we were not planting. And it was mm -hmm. thank you for the hunt and thank you mm -hmm. for the gathering and thank yeah. you for the berries. Now we're in autumn. The, the blackberries are just beginning to, to die down. But so much life is around us. So no, I think when I say it, it's I'm almost remembering our nomadic. Yes, that we'd be praying yes. that there would be fish in the next bit of water we come to, and the seeds we plant here for the next people to, you know, yeah. it. We've it, it's about food, isn't it? Ba basically, food and water and shelter. Humans in bodies, and yes. we need that. Yes. And yes. fire. We would carry our fire, this tiny little yeah. ember, with us. Yeah, from place to place to place, and it would be home and light and comfort, and the ability to cook. And that magic of, as you said, when you reach that place of the hollow bone where I don't need to impose me anymore, and even speaking, I'm aware that I am imposing me saying this, but the fire gets to speak. Mm. And if we could spread around the world the understanding that if you let it, the fire wants to speak, the water wants to help, mm -hmm. the earth wants to talk through us, the air wants to be given voice. Wouldn't the world be such a different place? Absolutely. <laughs> and so a very big part of the tradition is Vision Quest. Right. And um, it's quite interesting, one of the countries I work with, which is in full lockdown now, they a few of them have decided, even though they're probably not allowed to, that they need to go and sit on the mountain and pray. They need to right. listen. And there's something about those old ways that are as irrelevant now as ever, and they are about this level of listening, this level of calming down to be able to hear yeah. what is wanted of us individually and collectively. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came 
to this lineage? Because I, way, way, way back, you you trained in biodynamic psychotherapy in the Gerda Boysen School, mm-hmm. I think, and you've been mm-hmm. a midwife. You are still a midwife, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. And yet, it seems to me that the core of your life revolves around the spirits that guide you and mm-hmm. the holding of the fire through these ceremonies. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that's true. I think my journey with the unseen world started very young, but I probably wouldn't have had words for it very young. I was at boarding school and my sanctuary was some of the trees on the land, making dens there. That was my sanctuary, my safe place. My my deep connection with the earth started then. I just thought it was normal, but, you know, that was very, very important to me. And um, and also, weirdly enough, Christianity, you know, I was able to go to the chapel. And so that was a quiet, safe place. Mm-hmm. And as I got older, that changed. Then I started nursing. And, you know, at a very young age, 18, 19, I'm laying out bodies. And it created some big questions in me. You know, what happens at death? And I had some very profound experiences with patients who told me things and things I saw. So it definitely awoke that search. And what happened is I was about 30, I was 30, and I ended up hearing that there was a Mexican medicine man in town and we were invited to join this ceremony. I had absolutely no idea what the ceremony was really about, but I knew I had to be there. And actually I was sitting in the circle in the early hours of the morning and one of the women was working with a feather fan. She was doing healing with the fan. And I heard myself saying, but I do that. I do, I know that. Oh, interesting. So it was, it was very deep for me. It was a, a profound coming home, really. Right. And then within a few months, I went up the mountain. I did my vision. Because I just, everything arrived in that moment for me. And... Um, I invited this medicine man to come to England. I really felt we needed that work in England. I was living at Spain in Spain at the time, which meant I had to come back to England and start organizing something here. I wasn't so keen about that, but that's what happened. And, you know, a family gathered, a community circle became a circle, which, and we would go to Vision Quest each year. And then eventually I I was asked if, you know, I would accept being initiated as a medicine woman and to continue Hmm. doing this work and holding it. I was very reluctant, actually. I was young and I was reluctant, but I said yes. Because you were a mother of young children at that point? It wasn't, I was, but it wasn't that. I think I had a memory of a level of responsibility and um, I, I'm not an extrovert and I kind of saw what, saw without knowing what I was seeing, what would lie ahead. Right. And um, and it carries a lot of memory for right. me. Of previous existences. It's a lot of grief, yes. Yeah. And so um, it's like coming to a, a lover that you love so much and yet with it carries so much. Right. It's something like that for me. Gosh. Yeah. So let, can we stay with the grief a little bit and see, is this a grief of colonialization and a crushing of the old ways or do you think it goes deeper than that can it go deeper than that <laughs> i think it can Sorry. sadly i mean yes. no that was horrendous and and unspeakable and you know the the biggest genocide ever on our planet is the killing of the the indigenous peoples around the world yes to make way for you know what we have now but but yet i wonder I don't know. I have an instinct that there is something underneath. Yeah, I think it's layered. So I think it is, for whatever reason, grief is, I'm a grief walker. I'm very familiar with that, almost comfortable. I think it starts with existential, separation from the oneness. Um, I don't know if it starts with that, but that's the, the deepest place. Then there's the memory of the, the colonialism, exactly, and, and, and knowing and remembering the desecration and the loss of the tribe and the people. And that is a very body memory that I have. And there's a lot also about what's happened to women through the witch hunt that I carry. Also that got very re-triggered by being an independent midwife and just feeling it in my, 
So it's layered and layered and layered. And I'm in a different place now. I'm just absolutely not having it anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is what these times are. You know, it's like um, I've, I've lost a lot. And actually now I feel very, uh, I'm on the, we're on the front line. And I'm happy to be there. And I know that whatever happens, we're going to keep doing this work to the last breath. And that it, I'm not looking at outcome. Well, I am, but who knows when that will come through. I, I, I know that we're in the times that we've been praying for, for this change, which means a dismantling, which is painful. Yes. So um, there's so much in this, and I would like to touch on on your experience, personal experience of grief. But you just said not looking at outcome, and then you qualified that with, well, I am. And and can you can you say a little bit more about the outcome that you might be glancing at sideways? So hard to put it into words. I'm sort of just trying to feel it. You and know. take time. It's fine. Spaces are fine yeah. on a podcast. Um. Okay. So when when I'm really trying to expand and feel it, I I meet almost the the sadness, the grief, the longing. And um, it is about the honoring of the earth. It's like I love tending and making altars and that honor. A very big part of our ceremonial work is honoring each other and the earth and the elements and the water and the dawn and the bird song, the simplest things, the natural rhythms. And that loss of honor and respect and humility, I, I find it unbearable where we've put ourselves as humans in the web of life. And so my longing is that we return to our place within the web of life. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, because that is also my great, great end point also. And I don't know what exactly that will feel like because it feels to me there was a point when we were in context, when we did live as part of the web of life for a very long time of human evolution. Mm -hmm. And then something happened, whatever it was, and we are where we are. And yet everyone who undergoes near-death experiences and comes back says, stop worrying, everything is as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And and my conscious mind finds that really hard to get to grips with. But the bit of me that hears it, hears there was something that we had to do, something that we had to learn, something that we had to become, so that when we step once again into that full honoring, into that openness of I am here to do whatever you need of me. We are bringing something different with us. And I don't know what that is. And therefore, I have no concept of how we can be when we fully step back in. But it does, it still shines out there as the light at the end of a somewhat winding and difficult tunnel. Does that resonate with you? Yes, totally, which is why I suppose I can't give details of how I imagine it. I can only know how I'd feel. Yes. So say more about how you'd feel, because I ask a lot of our students to to feel how would it be if we got it right, and I get a lot of emails going, I genuinely don't know how to do that. So could you just tell us how you would feel a little? And again, I know when this I, is hard. It's the edges of ourselves. When I drop into my body, it's... A, sa a profound safety, mm -hmm. an expansion, and it's how we feel when we come out of ceremony where there's time, somehow time gets stretched, and it's achingly beautiful. Mm. And when I say achingly beautiful, it's, it's the beauty of grief, where it's the sweet grief, where the child's laughter absolutely just opens your heart you know really s simple um and those are the, the the things that give me that feeling so it's very 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 expanded and also very connected to the fact that life is continuous beyond death yeah and i know that i i i'm very blessed to know that in my being and so when you're expanding to that knowing, uh, I think if, if you could really everyone have that knowing, how we'd live out our lives would look very different. Yes, 
Yes. It would be ceremonial a lot of the time. Yeah. You know, there would be, it's it's like the dagger of people, you know, when they have their grief ceremonies every single day. Yes, yes. Because I it's just the thinking importance that. Yes. of knowing that our relationship with our uh, the spirit beings is so alive and so full and giving them space for that, everything changes and we have none of it in our yes. mainstream paradigm. So it yes. feels empty yes. and unfulfilling. It doesn't nourish us. We're not nourished. Yeah. So that's why it's filled with all the other things. Yeah, all the stuff that we don't need. And that sense, Mickey Kashtan talks about the patriarchal wounds of powerlessness and scarcity mm. and separation mm. it, all of that exactly. and and this is the healedness of that and and I was really struck by you the first thing you said was safety and that always I don't know how unsafe I feel until I drop into that space where I feel safe and it's absolutely it's so absolutely. liberating and yeah and and then I can let go and and be and and then experience that I love what you said about the sweet grief and the child's laughter opening up your heart and just be fully human. And there is something about the unsafety and the separation that has left us not being fully human. And if we could be that again, all of us, yeah, we're back to wouldn't it be wonderful? It really, really would. And I think going back to the ceremonial work, there's something about being in that very, very held space that yes. there is safety that's actually yes. experienced, which allows these deep feelings to move that have been carried for so long, whether it's yes. ancestral pain or personal, you know, yes. it just allows it to move because there is enough safety and holding to go there. Yes. And that's what I, I suppose where I totally trust that is through my experience as being an independent midwife. I know that if I can create a space that's really safe for the mother and do nothing and say nothing, she'll find her way because it's a natural process. Right, but you have to create the space first. And that's within me as well yeah. as without me, yes. Yeah, yeah. I would love to explore that, the independent midwife. So let's put that come back to that because your ex personal experience of grief also seems to me to be a big part of where you are at this moment. And I wondered if you would be able to speak a little bit about that. Yes. So, like I say, it feels like I came in with grief, didn't really maybe know why, but it's mm. definitely been with me. And um, child ex experiences, boarding school and all of mm. that made it even more concrete. And then I worked for, a v I, I then got very ill. My lungs were really really not in a good place and I understood well through a lot of work it became clear that it was un unexpressed grief that was just feeling like a stone on my lungs and as she had physicalized to damage my lungs mm. so I actually had to do a lot of really deep work for, for about 10 years wow. which kind of Help me really see the pathways, I think, yeah. which I now use with in my practice with my clients. There's, there's pathways of releasing deep emotion. Right. Almost making space for other parts of you to come in. Yes. Whatever your spiritual belief is, whoever you believe is there that's bigger than us, it doesn't really matter to me what it is. I just want to support people finding that and knowing that they're not walking around just on their own in isolation yes. to a bigger story. Yes. So yes, I've I was I've been working with that sort of my whole life and was just sort of feeling like it was almost I mean done is a not quite done, but you know, I was doing was much lighter. And then um two years ago, pretty much to the day, my son died, my nineteen year old son. Um Nothing could prepare us for that. It was uh, death by misdemeanor. Oh my goodness! And my children really, and my well, my we were a very, very, very tight. Me, and my daughter, and my son were very tight. It took it basically utterly dismantled me, utterly. I wondered if I'd ever run a sit in front of the fire again. I didn't lose. I didn't lose trust in God, goddess, the one, actually, 
Mm. But I couldn't get it. And But what was incredible is that because of years of ceremonial work, there's a very, very big family. I call, we call each other family. I mean, on the way to, on my mailing list, is, you know, it's 800 people, but it's, inter- it's worldwide, yep. this, this lineage. And I was caught in the net of my family. You know, the people arrived at a house we were given and the fire was lit, the cedar was burning, the songs were going. I wailed and wailed. We all wailed together. It was extraordinary. I mean, it was, it, it was beautiful as much as it could be beautiful in that moment. You know, they sorted out the funeral for me. I mean, I just was taken by my tribe. There were pipe ceremonies all across the world. And I needed to know that that work was happening so my son would be okay on the other side. Yeah, You know, the mother, it doesn't stop here. As a mother, I still want my boy to be elevating and not get stuck. And that work happened. It was incredible. I'm eternally grateful. Um, And somehow two years later, uh, a lot of me has returned. I mean, this it's going to take me years to overcome the shock. But I have even felt the ecstasy of that grief. And I never, ever thought I'd be able to say that, ever. And it is something about the work that happened that elevated him and me that I feel like he's my guide now. Right. He's um, helping me to know realms of ecstasy and bliss of expanded love that, do you know, I was so unidentified with, I didn't even know if I wanted to really feel those sort of things. You know, I've been working with grief in the shadow for a long time. And yeah. I mean, I do want to, but it, it, it's challenging for me. But I have to say, you know, in in the last few weeks, uh, the connection's so profound and so beautiful and it's really helping me keep standing. And I'm sure there'll be dips again. Mm. But I can see how it supports the work that I do because it's all about communicating with the spirits and he's always there. And so it's the whole circle get this transmission that we're really not alone, nice. that our journeys with our beloveds in the spirit world continue. And they long to support us. They long to be in communication with us. They long for us to know that they're there. Yes. And it's all been shut down when we were so young. So it's very difficult for us to trust our connection with spirit. It's very alien. And we. Uh, and then there's lots of examples a bit with the new aging bypass that makes it, 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 so it's quite difficult, the language around it. Um. Yes. And I feel I'm being initiated. Uh, you know, it's a new p- pr- process. I'm writing a book about it. I've been asked to write a book about it, which is very challenging right. because I feel like I'm very much in the journey at the moment. Yes. Is this a publisher who's asked you to write about grief in general or about your personal experience of this event? Well, when they asked me, I was in grief in general, re- particularly relating to the climate change grief. Right. Um, it felt like... When Arrow died was also the time the real consciousness suddenly shifted. It was two years ago, and I really felt something extra happened at that time. And the following year, Extinction Rebellion really Mm. got going, and it somehow, it's very related. So I was asked to write a book about climate change grief from my own personal journey. And now they just, they want my journey instead, I think. So it's interesting. Right. It's all um, changing, yeah. And and because that changes, my own experience of writing books is it, it's it's always an ongoing process. You never finish a book. You just decide at some point that you need to stop with the alterations for now. Okay. And I'm imagining something like this when it's, as I'm hearing it, this feeling is evolving in you almost daily, capturing mm-hmm. it in its fluid times enough to put it down on paper. First of all, does that change the process for you? And second, how do you know which bits to put down and how bits, how, which bits you leave until they have evolved further? It's a very good question, Mando, and I've probably come for you for some uh, 
guidance on it actually I've never written before so it's really new and okay. I think I'm trying to write from two places one place is the place that I communicate in ceremony yeah. there's a part that wants to speak from that place and then there's another part that wants to speak from the mother the yeah. raw mother so yeah. they're both um I you know in lockdown was an amazing time to write then it's all stopped and so I'm mm. literally just recording moments right um and then I'll go back into it. So it's very new for me, this whole process. And I was not sure how much I was wanting to do it. And then I really saw that it could really support my own journey. And then I didn't know if it would really support anyone else's journey. Um, so I'm very in and out of um, the whole thing, really. Okay. Um, it feels very vulnerable. Yes. But it also feels congruent with what I teach and stand for, which is our vulnerability is so powerful. Our vulnerability is so beautiful and it will touch people and it is healing. It just takes a lot of courage. Yes. yes and I, mean. I truly, truly believe that grief is almost like a, I kind of feel it's like a being. Hmm. And if you can surrender to the being of grief and allow her to work you, really surrender. I just have so much trust, actually, in grief, like being worked by grief as a being. Yes. And my experience, you know, it can take you to places which you just don't know if you'll ever come back for. And then you mm. kind of get a break Yeah. where you can recharge and you kind of, and then you're taken again. And, and, and there's such a wisdom. There's just such a wisdom. Yes. And letting ourselves, it's that letting go, isn't it, that so many people... I've, I've spoken to so many people who feel at a core level that if they take the lid off their grief once, they will never get it back on again and they will be utterly overwhelmed forever. And yet the experience is, as you say, that it's it's a waveform and bits of the wave feel as if we're drowning and bits of the wave we're surfing and it's glorious. And even the drowning after a while I feel it's glorious. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's space. That's it. it's, I mean, you yes. hold out, but then you get space inside yes. you and you're not so contracted. But I feel like that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about I don't think it's something that should always be done in isolation. Yes. And so it needs witnessing so that you can feel the yes. compassion of someone else. Yes. You can feel like you're not mad. That it yes. because you feel mad and, and maybe you do go a bit mad. Maybe it's a healthy mad. Um, <laughs> but it's about being witnessed. And so then you can when you've been witnessed enough in it and held through, you can then start trusting mm. that it will get you to the other side. And I suppose that takes me back to the midwifery, just yes. really trusting that if you can hold the space enough and you know. As a midwife, sometimes I just had to look in the woman's eyes and they knew I trusted it and it was that transmission they needed that they could trust it. Right. And it's a bit like the same if I'm holding somebody in deep grief. I, I don't, there's no words, but they can feel in me that I'm not frightened. Yes. And so they're allowed to go where they need to go because yes. I'm not frightened. Yes. And me not many people are not frightened because we're so frightened of death and it's all so connected. Yes, and... Were you unafraid of death before your son's death, do you think? Or have you become unafraid oh, yes. as a process of that? Oh, yes. No, I, I, because, because um, I think it takes me back to nursing. Right. I, yes. I know it's a doorway to an, another yeah. level. I don't want to die, but um, I'm not at all frightened of dying. Yeah. It's in, yes, I think as a veterinary surgeon, it's that thing that, that death not only is a doorway, it is sometimes such a relief and a release. Yeah, and I I look at the you know, the super rich in California who are having themselves cryopreserved so that they can be brought back, and I think I I have a a book half written called "It's Only Hell of You Remember" of what happens to somebody when they have died and then they are summoned back by the will that they wrote when they were alive, and and how would you feel? And and I think it's 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 a it's a form of extraordinary insanity. To, to think that once you've died, you'll want to come back. Uh, just, uh, yeah, that, let's, that, that's a very different conversation. We have a few minutes left before we are at the end of I'd our... I'd love to just share a little story. Please do, yes, yes. But actually, one of the turning points in, when you say, am I afraid of death, was when I was about 19, and it was a Sunday morning, I was nursing, 
And uh, it was in my early part of my nurse training. And so we were told to go and talk to the patients. So I went and sat on, on, it was a quiet afternoon, and I went and sat and was talking to this woman, and she'd had a major heart attack and been resuscitated and survived. And I remember her saying, can I share something with you? And I said, yes. And she said, I want to tell you what happened. And she said, I died. And it's the same story you hear everywhere. You know, the white tunnel, Mm. it was so beautiful. There was so much love and I just wanted to go. I wanted to go so much. And then I knew that my daughter who just had a child really needs me. And I was so torn. And then they started resuscitating me. So I made a decision I would come back. But I, it was so hard. And I don't know if the ex- those were the exact words, but the transmission of the beauty and love that she had experienced, I felt. Right. And I had a few moments, I had a few experiences like that, and that changed something about death for me. I'm sure I must have been wired to not, to be very connected to those realms anyway, yeah. but they were very transformational. Thank you. Because you said right at the beginning that you'd had experiences and I wanted to ask, but I also wasn't sure if it was appropriate and I didn't want to to stop the flow. So I'm so glad that we came back to that because that feels enormously powerful. As we're heading towards the close, is there anything that you would like to say that you feel is incomplete of what we have talked about? I don't know. I don't think there's anything. I think I just want to say to anybody listening, we're in this together and we can really make a more beautiful world. I I believe it. I really believe it. We might not experience it, but we're not doing it just for us. We're doing it for the children to come. So whoever's listening, thank you and um, know you're not alone. Yes. No, you're not alone. The more beautiful world is possible. And we are working for the generations yet to come. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. We will come back again and talk about midwifery. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you, Amanda, for this work. It's really good. (laughs) So that's it for another week. Huge thanks to Fiona for the profound integrity of her work and for the heartfelt nature of her sharing. If we could all really connect with the land in the way that she describes the world would be a different place. And she does hold ceremonies, and there are other ceremonies held around the world, of lineages aligned to this one. We are all indigenous to somewhere. There is always help somewhere. And if we can create a network, finding ways to connect everyone who listens to this podcast to someone of the same integrity and groundedness and authenticity that Fiona carries, then we are well on the way to being the change that the world needs us to be. In the meantime, we will be back next week with another conversation. And if you have ideas of people you would like to hear on the podcast, do get in touch. Many of you have been, and I am booked up pretty much to the end of the year. So if you send ideas and don't hear it immediately, then please know I am following everything up. Not everybody says yes, and there are only 52 weeks in a year. We might move to two podcasts a week, but I suspect we might overdo things a little, overcook things. You might not want that. Let me know how you'd feel if you think that would be good. You can get in touch with me at Manda, that's Manda with an M, at accidentalgods.life. And in the meantime, thanks as ever to Caro C for the music at the head and foot of the podcast and for the sound production. Thanks to Faith Tillery for being the other half of the creative team that is Accidental Gods and for designing the website. If you want to visit us there, we are at accidentalgods.life and you will find the show notes there, the other podcasts, the visualizations and meditations in the resources section and the Accidental Gods membership program which is designed to give you the grounding that will let you make the connections to the elements and to ask the questions that
that Fiona has been talking about so eloquently. It absolutely does help to do the ceremony as part of a tribe, but we can do the groundwork on our own land, in our own time, and that's what Accidental Gods is aiming to give you, the groundwork so that when you step into ceremony, you understand and you have already opened connections to what is there. So if you know of anyone who would like to be part of creating that more beautiful world that we know is possible for us and for the generations yet to come, do send them this link. And in the meantime, that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you and goodbye.